Okay, thank you. So I'm going to be talking about two tools I've been working on with collaborators at Princeton, Microsoft, and IntentionNet for proactively finding and preventing bugs in network configurations. Uh, so this work was very much motivated by the observation that network configuration is still to this day very hard. And it's hard for a number of different reasons. So for example, one of these reasons is that networks are inherently very complex. Uh, a typical network is running uh, multiple protocols like BGP or you know, OSPF. And these protocols can interact in very subtle ways with mechanisms like route redistribution. Uh, in addition, the configuration languages that are provided by vendors are typically very low level. So you have to talk about uh, protocol level parameters. You have to configure interface level metrics and filters like route maps and access control lists. And even if you can do this correctly for one device, a uh, network is made up of many devices, so now you have to configure every device correctly and do so in such a way that the emergent behavior of all of these devices does the correct thing. And in particular, this is, gets even more complicated when you factor in the fact that uh, links and routers in a network can fail some sort of arbitrarily. And when you put all of these together, it's not so surprising that misconfigurations are much more common than you would uh, expect. Um, so for example, a quick Google search will reveal uh, dozens of top line news articles about major network outages related to misconfiguration, and you can find new ones seemingly every couple of months or so. And in particular, these misconfigurations can be very expensive as well. So uh, in terms of operator time that's spent uh, debugging and finding these problems, and in terms of lost revenue due to the outages, uh, they can quickly tally up a, a very large um, expense. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to be describing two tools we've been building to try to find and prevent these kinds of bugs in, in your networks. The first part of the talk will be about Minesweeper, which is a new open source tool for finding bugs in legacy uh, networks. And the second part of the talk will be about Propane, which goes the other direction. It's a top-down approach, which lets you design at a very high level new networks, and then it will generate all of the low-level configurations for you. OK, so let me talk a little bit about Minesweeper. So in order to understand why we thought a tool like Minesweeper would be useful, let's think about how you can go about finding bugs in your network currently. So one uh, approach is what I'm going to call heuristics. And there's a number of tools that will do this. And the idea is to take your network configurations, do some sort of string matching on those configurations to look for the presence or absence of certain configuration features and then flag potential issues accordingly. So for example, you can detect things like violations of best practices or you know, poorly um, uh, designed passwords for, for different devices and so on. The problem with this approach is that it can miss many bugs. It can report false positives, things that aren't actually bugs. And in general, it's very hard to test any kind of forwarding behavior of your network using this approach. So if you do want to test the forwarding behavior of your network, the current sort of best approach is to either use simulation or emulation. So the idea is to take the network control plane, all of the configurations, run them through a simulator or an emulator, produce the data plane, and then check the data plane for correctness by using tools like traceroute, investigating the forwarding tables, and so on. But this also has a number of limitations. So for example, certain bugs are only going to be triggered in the presence of very specific EBGP uh, routing advertisements for neighbors. And so if you're using a simulator, you can't realistically test out all possible combinations of routing advertisements from your neighbors, because you'd have to rerun the tool over and over again for each combination. Similarly, certain configuration bugs are only going to be uh, present it, when certain links fail. And again, a simulator, you can't realistically, for large enough networks, uh, try out every combination of link failures to see if your network's still going to be running correctly. So Minesweeper was developed to try to overcome these limitations. Uh, it can check a number of properties of your network for all possible combinations of external routing messages and for all possible combinations of link failures. And it does this by translating your network into a collection of logical constraints which can then be solved by an off-the-shelf constraint solver. And these tools have been developed over many, many decades to be very efficient at uh, finding inputs that can violate constraints. Uh, it's available as open source software, and you can find it on GitHub. And we've used it to find bugs in real networks as well. OK, so the typical workflow of a tool like Minesweeper is as follows. Uh, 
So you start with some collection of vendor-specific configurations. Uh, you'll have them in various formats, maybe Cisco, maybe Juniper, maybe Arista. We run these through a tool uh, called Batfish, which can, which can parse them into a vendor-independent format. From here, we use Minesweeper to translate this into logical constraints. You can then add a query on top of this, and we throw it at a uh, constraint solver, which can then check whether or not there are ever going to be inputs to your network that can cause issues. So just to dive a little bit into sort of more technically what's happening uh, in terms of how Minesweeper works, if you have a network like I've shown on the left here with three routers, R1, R2, and R3, um, the first thing we do is we deconstruct this network into what I'm going to call a protocol view of the network. So each router gets split into the constituent protocols that run on that router. So for example, R1 might be running BGP, which is connected to its neighbor R2, and it might be connected to some external peer as well, N1. It might be running OSPF with other neighbors as well as a number of other protocols. We can then refine this a bit further by zooming in on a particular protocol. So this is what I'm going to call the constraint view of the BGP process on R1. And the idea is that we're going to add arrows between the different processes running on these uh, routers to indicate the, the flow of control plane information. So for example, if connected routes are redistributed into BGP, then we're going to add an arrow between the R1 connected protocol and the R1 BGP protocol. And the idea then is that we're going to associate protocol messages along each of these edges in this data structure. Uh, so basically, R1's BGP process might export certain routes to R2's BGP process, and R similarly, R2's BGP proce process will import certain messages from R1's BGP process. The main difference, though, is that rather than computing what these protocol messages are going to be using something like simulation, we're going to treat these as unknown values. We're going to treat them as variables whose values we don't know. So for example, a BGP message has a prefix, which is 32 bits in the case of IPv IPv4, um, but we're not going to say what exactly that prefix is. And the idea is that instead of uh, simulating the network, we're going to constrain the various protocol messages in the network using these logical constraints. And in particular, the import and export filters in your configurations are going to define the relationships between these messages. So for example, if R1's BGP process has an import filter from R2's BGP process, um, this defines a collection of constraints relating the messages sent by R2 and the messages received from R1 and BGP. Okay, so just to make this a bit more concrete, I thought I would show an example uh, demo of how you can actually use Minesweeper on a real network. So I'm going to be using it to analyze the network I have shown here. Uh, this is a simplified version of a campus network where the campus network is autonomous system AS2. It has a collection of border routers which connect to upstream ISPs, a, a tier of core routers which serve as route reflectors in the network, and a tier of distribution routers which connect to individual academic departments. And so in particular, I'm just going to be showing how I can check a reachability property between one of the hosts in this department and the border routers in this network. So I want to make sure that the border routers will always have a route to uh, host one here. OK, so the first thing I would do with my, uh, Minesweeper is I can load up the Batfish analysis tool in interactive mode to run queries. This is going to bring up the Batfish interface, where I can then parse the configurations for this network. I do this by pointing it at a folder that contains all of the network configurations in it, and that's the only input that you need to give it. It'll infer the topology and everything from here. Once the configurations are parsed and loaded by Batfish, we can run Minesweeper queries on it. So for example, I wanted to check reachability uh, between two devices in my network, so I can issue a reachability query. I'm going to specify where packets can start, start from, where I'm injecting them into the network. So I care about reachability from any ingress node um, any border ingress node, which I specify with a regular expression here. I'm interested in the packets being able to reach a destination node, which is the department router I was talking about, AS2 department 1. And I'm, in particular, I'm interested in a reachability to a destination interface, which is a particular interface on that department 1 router. And so I can issue this command to Minesweeper, and it will check and try to find some possible cl uh, collection of inputs to this network that can violate the property. And so in this example, what it's done is it's found an example 
uh, where this property doesn't hold. So it gives us the packet, including the various fields that are relevant uh, for the counter example. In this case, the source and destination IP and nothing else. It also gives us a collection of BGP routing advertisements from neighbors. So for example, here it found that a particular BGP advertisement from one of the ISPs with particular community values attached and a particular prefix and prefix length and BGP path length is basically gonna cause a problem. And the problem is that this BGP advertisement is essentially hijacking traffic away from the intended destination of host one in our network. And then finally, the tool is gonna give us the forwarding uh, behavior under this counter example that it found uh, in the network. Okay, so the problem was that we're not filtering the, this type of advertisement from our neighbor in our configurations. So if we wanted to fix this problem, what we could go uh, do is go into the configuration and add an additional route map entry, which blocks advertisements from this ISP uh, for the, the types of routes that I'm, are supposed to be outbound from my network. So I can go ahead and add an additional route map entry for outbound routes in this configuration file for the border router. Then I'm gonna reparse uh, the configurations using Batfish and then reissue the reachability command in Minesweeper. And so this time it's gonna come back and it's gonna tell us that it was actually able to guarantee that this property holds no matter what BGP routing advertisements you hear from peers. I might also be interested in checking that this property holds in my network for all single failures. So I can add the argument that it should consider all combinations of one network failure. And so once again, it'll come back and it'll tell us that it's able to guarantee that this property holds uh, for all possible combinations of now one failure and BGP advertisements. And if I did this for two failures, then it would find another counterexample because it could partition the topology. So I showed how you can check properties like reachability in a network. Um, there are also a number of other properties we can check with Minesweeper. So for example, we can check if multiple routers in your network are always going to have equal uh, length paths to a particular destination. We can check if there's any packet which will ever experience a routing loop under any situation. Uh, we can check if you're using ECMP, if basically you ever drop a packet on one path, but not along another path, which might arise if you have a misconfigured access control list, for example. We can also check properties like do two routers uh, serve equal roles, like in a data center. So you might have two spine routers that you wanna check basically that do the same thing for all possible inputs. The current features that Minesweeper supports are basically most of OSPF as well as BGP. So right now we support BGP local preference, communities, meds, uh, prepending aggregation, as well as IBGP and route reflectors. Uh, we also support static routes, route redistribution, multipath routing, and ACLs. Uh, we currently don't support IPv6, although there's no technical reason why this can't be added in the future. Um, so to look at how well Minesweeper performed, uh, we basically ran it on a collection of 152 legacy data center networks we obtained from a large cloud provider. And we didn't really know what the intended policy in this network was, so we tried to check properties that we thought would, should always hold sort of regardless of the, the network. So we checked two properties in particular. One was uh, reachability to management interfaces in the network. Um, surprisingly, we, we actually found uh, 67 violations of this property. Um, most of them were caused by some particular environment, so basically a, a BGP hijacking type of attack, where a BGP peer would send an advertisement with a particular prefix length and path length um, and would override the BGP decision process on one or more of the routers. We also checked the uh, equivalence of routers property on a bunch of uh, these uh, routers in the data center based on the naming scheme. So similarly named routers we figured should probably be uh, roughly configured equivalently. We found about 29 violations of this property. Uh, most of them were, seemed to be caused by some sort of like fat finger copy paste style mistake where every router in a group would have the same exact uh, configuration except one or two which would be missing a couple of ACL entries. Uh, in terms of scalability of the tool, uh, so the networks we tested on so far have been um, mostly somewhat small around the order of like 30, 30 routers, um, but the tool does seem to be fairly fast for these. So this is showing the time it takes to verify the reachability and the equivalence of these router properties uh, for these various networks sorted by lines of configuration. 
Um, and so the takeaway was that it can, can be very fast in practice. So it found a lot of these violations in about 60 milliseconds for the reachability and about 400 milliseconds for the equivalence of routers. Uh, so just to conclude for Minesweeper, so it's the, again, it's this a new general purpose control plane verification tool. Um, it can check a variety of properties for all possible collections of BGP advertisements for all possible combinations of link failures, and it does this by translating the network into these logical constraints that constraint solvers can solve fairly efficiently, rather than simulating the network. Uh, we've used this to find many bugs in real networks, and again, you can find this on, on GitHub uh, as open source. Okay, so the second tool I want to talk about is called Propane, and so Propane takes sort of the, the a very different approach. So it says, why are we still writing configuration files in this low-level assembly-like language? Um, why don't we have a new higher level language where we describe only the intent of the entire network and then we generate the configurations from there in a way that we know they're going to be correct. So at a very high level, the way Propane works is it, you start with one of these network-wide routing policies, uh, which I'm going to call a Propane policy. You feed that to the Propane compiler along with the network topology. And then the compiler will generate these configurations that run on unmodified vendor hardware. Um, and in particular, we targeted BGP configurations uh, with Propane just because it's a very flexible routing protocol that can implement uh, a variety of different types of policies. So a, in a little more detail, what Propane can do uh, is basically it has two components. So it has a language where you talk about your network-wide routing policy. Um, you do this in terms of what I call path constraints and preferences. So you can say things like, I prefer that traffic leaves my network through one peer over another, or traffic should never go through some autonomous system. And basically, you, you use the same language to write both your intra and inter-domain routing policy. So the compiler takes care of figuring out what should go where. Uh, the second part of Propane is this compiler. It generates BGP configurations, and it's taking the centralized policy and breaking it down into a distributed implementation with BGP. And the guarantee that it makes is that basically, uh, modulo any compiler bugs, it, you have policy compliance, so it means it always does what the centralized policy intended um, for all possible combinations of failures. So it always uses the best route available according to the policy you wrote. Um, so to see how Propane can work on a simple toy example, I thought I'd show how we can configure a little data center network. So I've got a data center here shown in yellow with a collection of routers. The data center is connected to two uh, autonomous systems. One is an inter-data center network that connects various data centers. Another is a core sort of backbone transit network that connects to other networks. And the data center is partitioned, so I have some top of rack routers, which might have services that should be globally accessible, and I might have some others that are uh, local services that should be reachable only inside my data center. Okay, so I might have some policy objectives, like the local services should be reachable internally only, the global prefixes should be reachable everywhere. I might want to perform aggregation in my network uh, at the border of the network to reduce the size of my routing tables. I might have other constraints that I care about. So for example, I might prefer that traffic leaves my network through one peer over another peer. So for example, I might prefer that traffic leaves through the uh, highly optimized inter-data center network over the core network. Um, I also might want to do things like prevent transit traffic between two different peers of my data center. So I never want my data center to become a transit point. Okay, so let's see how we can uh, configure this network using Propane. So this is an example of a Propane file. Uh, so it consists of a sequence of definitions. So I've defined a collection of, uh, and could you run the demo, please? Thank you. And so it consists of a sequence of these uh, definitions. So I've defined uh, uh, names for various prefixes in my network at the top of the file. I've defined, for example, what is a local prefix. So a local prefix in this case might be either prefix three or prefix four, uh, corresponding to these top of rack routers. Uh, I can define things like what is a peer of my network. A peer is either the inter-data center network uh, or it's the core backbone network. And so I can describe that using the set notation here. And then I can add constraints on how I want traffic to be routed through my network. So for example, for the global uh, prefix, prefix one, 
I want to add the constraint that traffic for that prefix should end up at router A. That's the final destination for that, that traffic. And I can add similar constraints for these other prefixes in my network. For any other traffic which is not internal to my network, I can add a constraint that says basically it should leave my network. It needs to end outside my network. And I can add other constraints. So for example, I want it to exit my network through either the inter-data center network or the core network. And I'm going to have a preference for the inter-data center network here. Um, and that's what the arrow arrow operator is saying. I can also add additional constraints uh, to this policy. So I can specify that I want the local prefixes to stay internal to my network. Um, so I'm going to add a new constraint which applies to these local prefixes. Um, and it's just going to say that these should be internal routes only. And then I basically just add that to the routing policy. I tell the, the propane compiler that I want it to satisfy this locality constraint. Uh, for the no transit constraint, again, I can just add an additional constraint to this policy. It's saying that I'm going to call it no transit. Uh, the policy constraint here is going to apply to all traffic, which I'm going to write by uh, true, which matches any, any traffic. And I'm going to add the constraint that traffic should not transit between two peers of my network. And I can define what that means. So transit in my network between a peer X and a peer Y is any traffic that enters my network through X or Y. Uh, and also is going to exit my network through either X or Y. And that's it. So this is a single policy file that I write for the entire network. And I can basically just add all of these constraints together and I'll send this off to the propane compiler. I give it the policy file I just wrote as an input and I give it a topology file which is specified in XML. And I just run the compiler and it generates uh, BGP configurations. So it, it generates a configuration file here and you can load them up. It's using you know, traditional B commands like prefix lists, uh, community lists, route maps, et cetera. Okay, so you can also add, like I was mentioning, things like aggregation. So you have purely control plane constraints. Um, so I can add a constraint which says that I want to perform aggregation at the border of my network. So I'm going to add this control plane constraint to the policy. Um, and I'm going to say that I want to perform aggregation for a slash 16 uh, prefix, um, which summarizes the global pre services of my network. And I want to perform aggregation from internal routers to, to external routers. And so once again, I'm going to uh, run the propane compiler. And it'll compile this as, again. Um, the difference here is that it was actually able to find a potential issue with this policy as I wrote it. So it's doing static analysis to figure out potential issues that can go wrong with the policy. So here it's found that basically the network is only safe for up to one uh, link failure. And in particular, after two link failures, you can get an aggregation-induced black hole. And so it provides an example of how uh, and such an aggregation-induced black hole can arise. So at a high level, the way the compiler works is it transforms the policy you write in, through a sequence of intermediate representations. So you write the initial uh, propane policy, which uh, is parsed by the front end of the compiler. This gets converted into a slightly simpler version that combines all of these constraints together called the RIR. We then merge this with the topology into a data structure, which lets us analyze both the topology and the routing policy together. And so this is where we can figure out how to decompose the policy you write into device by device configurations, how to set up things like BGP local preference and communities and so on. From here, we generate a slightly higher level uh, intermediate representation than uh, vendor specific languages. So I call it abstract BGP. Um, and so it's basically things like route maps, uh, access control list and whatnot, but not tied to any vendor. We do a number of minimization steps to try to make the policy as small and, and human understandable and readable as possible. And then as a final step, we generate individual uh, vendor configurations. And so right now, we're mostly targeting uh, Cisco and Quagga, although it's, it's fairly easy to extend this to add new vendor uh, languages. So more specifically, the uh, propane compiler, as I mentioned, generates Cisco and Quagga. It includes a number of other analyses that I really haven't gone into. So it has things like detecting unused backup paths. So if you write a policy which says to prefer one path over another, but it figures out that that second path can never actually be used, it'll let you know. Um, it can flag potential reachability issues that it thinks things should be reachable, but the way you've written it might just be a mistake. 
uh, it can find aggregation-induced black holes, as I, I showed you in the demo, as well as unused prefixes, unused aggregates, and so forth. Um, you can also ha configure the compiler with a number of different commands, so you can tell it that you do or don't want to use various BGP attributes, like meds or prepending or, or so on and so forth. So to test out the propane compiler, we, we were really interested in looking at two different things. One was, you know, can you actually express real policies in, in the language? And the second is, you know, can the compiler actually scale to real networks? So for the expressiveness part, we were able to acquire configurations from a large cloud provider. Um, and we tried, basically tried our best to convert these configurations into an equivalent propane policy. And these uh, configurations were described in high-level uh, English documents that the, uh, the networks had for the design of the network. Uh, and we tried this for both data center networks as well as for um, transit networks. And for compiler performance, we used the same routing policies that we converted from this cloud provider, but then scaled their topology by the number of routers to see how well the compiler could scale. So in terms of the expressiveness of the language, um, basically the, the full policy for the entire network took on the order of about 30 to 50 uh, lines of propane to configure. Um, and the actual generated networks are, are more like thousands of lines of configuration per router. So this seems to at least be a promising uh, start. In terms of compiler performance, we were able to scale up to about 1,400 routers for the data center example we had, and about 200 routers for the backbone network. Uh, the data center, the largest one, took about nine minutes to compile, and the uh, largest backbone network took about three minutes to compile. And this is a completely offline process, so it's not like you have to rerun the compiler um, in real time. Okay, so just to summarize on the propane portion of the talk. Uh, so propane is, again, a new high-level language. It gives you centralized network programmability, um, and it, it lets you write constraints in terms of preferred paths and backup paths and, and what types of uh, shape of path traffic should take through your network. Um, the core policy it tends to be quite concise because you're writing one configuration for your entire network. Uh, and the compiler then takes this policy and generates a completely distributed implementation via BGP, uh, BGP. We chose BGP because it's a very flexible routing language. Um, and it does, the compiler also does static analysis to basically check policy compliance um, with these BGP configurations for all possible failures. It also has a number of another, other analyses for checking the correctness in case you made um, certain types of mistakes. And it can scale to many uh, realistic sized uh, network topologies and routing policies. And again, the propane is available as open source. You can find it on uh, propanelang.org. Um, and so with that, I will uh, summarize. Since it's the last talk, we can get out of here a little bit early. Um, and I'll take any questions. You can email me if you have any uh, questions, comments, and concerns at uh, my Princeton email. Uh, thank you very much. Great talk, thank you, Matt Pitak, Yahoo. I noticed in your definitions file for propane, you had things like prefix, curly brace is zero, two to the 32 curly brace. And then at the end you sort of said, well, I don't do IPv6, but it should be easy to add. <clears throat> if you're doing iterative testing through the entire range of constraints like that, while v4, zero to two to the 32 isn't that bad, I think it'll be slightly non-trivial to do that for the V6 space, so. Uh. Yeah, so actually, I think, um, so the way these tools work, so when I say it's, it's a, a, some 32-bit value, the tool isn't actually searching through all 32-bit uh, prefixes. So there's some constraint that we generate which says that um, the prefix is some integer which is bounded between 0 and 2 to the 32. And the way these constraint solvers work is basically they're going to search through the space of values symbolically. So rather than looking at every particular value, they're going to look at only the ones that are relevant given the configurations you've written. So if I have a configuration file which has um, a route map that filters on a particular uh, prefix and that's the only filter I have, then there's really two cases, the ones that hit that filter and the ones that don't. And so it's exploring them like in, in that way. So when you go to IPv6, um, the constraint is basically going from uh, 
0 to 2 to the 64, but it's still only having to check a number of uh, different examples that's proportional to the policy you wrote rather than the actual space of values. Um, so at least we think it should scale um, fairly nicely. Avoiding the combinatoric exposure. Exactly. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. That's right. Talk. Thank you. Stage left. Uh, hi, I'm Crispy, IBM Software. Um, I like the stuff that you're presenting. On the propane one, I know that you're uh, dropping a Quagga slash Cisco config. How difficult is it to add like another vendor like Juniper or something? Is it something I could easily do or do I need to recompile absolutely everything? Yeah, so I think that's actually the easiest part of the compiler. I think the you know, it's like 50 lines of code is the actual translation, or you know, maybe 50 to 100 lines of code to translate to a particular vendor. So the intermediate representation we use is things like route maps, um, access control lists, things that are very easily uh, easy to translate to something like Cisco. Uh, it's just a syntactic um, change. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, we're really, because we're targeting, uh, we're generating these configurations in a particular way, we're choosing certain BGP features but not others, we only have to support the, that fraction of the configuration uh, language that the vendor has. So we only have to describe translation for you know, this subset of BGP, which also makes it a bit easier as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. I was just going to ask, would you mind putting your GitHub link back up? It's, uh, Google isn't finding Minesweeper very easily. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, let's see. Yeah, so it's available, uh, it's under the Batfish project, uh, which is an open source uh, network analysis framework. Um, and yeah, you can find it as a branch on Batfish. And there's instructions for installing and running Minesweeper at that URL. All right, great. Thank you very okay. much, Ryan. That was very informative.